So today I'm going to talk about Elasticsearch and I basically have kind of two topics. One is a quick introduction and one is just a bit about what makes Elasticsearch fast, how does it work in a distributed manner um, and a couple of like specialties and implementation details just to show you that we deeply care about making Elasticsearch as fast as possible. Uh, before I start, who of you has tried Elasticsearch in production? Not tried, but running? Okay, it's still a fair share. Uh, Logstash? Kibana? Ah, this looks good. Packet Beat, anyone? Okay, we need to work on that. Alright, so this is the agenda. I will come up with a quick introduction and then I will just go through a couple of examples what I think is important in the context of speed with Elasticsearch. Uh, just a quick overview of the company. So Elasticsearch is a fully distributed company. I live in Munich. We don't have any office there. We have a couple of offices across the world, like in Amsterdam, Mountain View, London, but it doesn't really matter where you live, which is a really nice company to work for, but it also means you change a lot of habits over time by working from home. Um, we started with Elasticsearch as a product, so we started to name the company as Elasticsearch. But over time, a couple of other products were added, like uh, the founder or original creator of Kibana and Logstash joined the company. Hadoop integrations happened, clients in specific languages happened. Uh, first commercial products were added, and Found as a hosted company was joined. So at some point in time, we thought it's smart to actually rename the company. And as you can see here, with this small and tiny logo, uh, we renamed the company and got a new logo over time. So what was Elasticsearch like three years ago has now become Elastic. I joined in early uh, 2013, so it's about two and a half years I've been working for Elastic. Uh, I mainly work on Elasticsearch, the core itself as developer, and on Shielded Watcher, which are two commercial plugins for Elasticsearch. Um, and being a developer obviously means you have a couple of other tasks as well, as delivering training, supporting customers, uh, talking at conferences obviously, and uh, yeah, unsurprisingly we are hiring as well as any other in the IT space right now. So if you have questions about working for Elastic, just drop me a note. Okay, one important thing if you start with Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, PacketBeat, or whatever is getting started with a new technology usually is a hard thing. Even though we try to think hard and make it as easy as possible, uh, you still require a bit of reading, you still require contact with other people. And we have a forum for all of our products, which is Elastic, uh, discuss.elastic.co. So if you have questions, please go to the forum, ask your questions, provide examples so we can kind of reproduce your problem and obviously and hopefully help. Second thing is, if you find things that are not working but are supposed to be working, use our GitHub issue tracker for all of our open source products. Just file an issue with a recreatable example so we can fix bugs. We like to fix bugs, so whenever you find something that's not working as expected, please file a bug. That's one of the few things how to improve a product. Last part, if you want to learn more about Elasticsearch, there are tons of meetup groups. But uh, yeah, looking in this space, it's kind of empty, so I don't think there's a meetup group in Riga. Uh, if you want to find one, just get in touch with us. Uh, if you start with Elasticsearch and you have never ever worked with it, get this book. It's called The Definitive Guide. It's like this thick. It's like 722 pages of really good content. And this means it takes longer than a day to read, but it's very well spent time. It's not only talking about Elasticsearch, it will also explain how distributed systems work, what are the drawbacks, advantages. It will tell you a lot about full text search because the theory behind that is very different to what you might know when working with a lot of databases. So please get this book if you want to get started. You can buy it from O'Reilly in this wonderful printed version or you can just read it online for free on the Elasticsearch, on, on the Elastic website. Okay. Let's start with a quick introduction. If you go to the homepage, you see this kind of yeah, titles or text that Elasticsearch is an open source, distributed, scalable, highly available, and so forth. So this is quite buzzword bingo compliant, but doesn't tell you really what Elasticsearch is. Um, if you look at the single item terms, we see that Elasticsearch is completely open source, as most of our products, which means you can modify it, you can change it, you can even sell it if you want, because it's the Apache license. But this also means you have to maintain it, so think twice about that. Um, it's distributed and scalable, which basically means you can run it as a single node, you can also run it as several nodes, and it kind of forms a cluster, and does a lot of those things by itself without having you to manually intervene. Uh, highly available is a bit of a tricky term, because obviously when running on commodity hardware and on several nodes, 
uh, highly available rather means that the likelihood of a system going down and breaking is much, much higher than running on a system, single system. So highly available in this context means that the system should be able to repair parts of itself when it notifies or when it gets notified about outages. And this is what is meant with highly available. If this node drops out of the cluster, you should still have a running system at the end of the day. Um, the communication with Elasticsearch itself usually works with using JSON and HTTP. Uh, the reason for this is that we kind of hope that every developer knows HTTP and its specific properties and JSON. So this is kind of the lingua franca of the internet nowadays, hopefully. Uh, and no, it doesn't support XML. Uh, it's a full text search engine. What does this mean? Uh, this is hopefully a website you all know. Um, and everything you search on Wikipedia is basically running against an Elasticsearch cluster in the background. And a full text search not only means you're searching for a term and you're getting back documents that are matching this term, uh, full text search nowadays also means you have support for suggestions, you have support for highlighting suggestions, the term you typed. So full text search is not just getting documents back. This is just something to keep in mind for, for general full text search. The last part is real-time search and analytics. Uh, what does this mean? So the analytics part in this example, this is Kibana, screenshot of Kibana 4. Uh, it's kind of showing uh, log files from Apache logs. And you can see that you basically see different log levels here that are being returned. So instead of just showing single documents, you should also be able to show aggregations and counts of documents and basically visualize, visualize them. And this is the analytics capabilities. You might know this as business intelligence and 300 other terms that uh, fancy companies have invented. But this is basically what we mean with analytics. One of the nice parts of Elasticsearch is that we try really, really hard to make it really easy for you to get up and running. So all you need is basically a running Java installation, Java 7 or Java 8. I hope no one uses Java 6 anymore, right? Um, and you can download the Elasticsearch zip file, you can unzip it, and you basically have to start it. And the moment you started it, and wait a couple of seconds until the startup is finished, you can start indexing documents, um, you can start querying it. So this is all you need to get up and running. So Java, that's it. No configuration file, just to test it out. This is all you need. OK, before we show a bit how you can add or remove data to Elasticsearch, we should talk about scalability, because it's one of the core features of Elasticsearch. Instead of running on a single node, you can run on a ton of nodes. But what does this mean? So imagine you fire up a single Elasticsearch instance. This is basically what I did here when starting with Elasticsearch. And that's an own process, an own JVM. It starts up. The process kind of looks around, doesn't see anyone else, and forms a cluster. A cluster is basically just a couple of nodes joined together. If there's no one else, the cluster has a size of one. If you spin up a second instance, and you can easily do that on your notebook, the second instance kind of looks around, sees, oh, there's another node, so I better join the cluster. And this is basically what happens. And the nice part about this game is you can play it with one node, two nodes, four nodes, 100 nodes. What, what kind of hardware you have or how many data you have. And this, this is the first part of scaling. This is basically the kind of how does a cluster work. The interesting part here is that the end user doesn't really need to know if you have a cluster with one node or with 100 nodes. For the end user, it's basically important that the end user gets the data back he queried for. And how many nodes are behind that is just an implementation detail. OK, we haven't talked about how data is actually distributed. Because we can't just, or what usually gets very hard is that you start with a single system, and at some point in the mean you split your data and send it to 20 systems. This is usually really tricky. So what Elasticsearch does here is when you create an index, and an index is basically just a kind of container where you put data into, you have to tell Elasticsearch into how many pieces this index should be divided. And a single piece is called a shard. So in this example, four shards are basically used to create a new index. And when you index a new document or new data, this data will be placed on one of those four shards. And what's nice about this solution is that if you fire up more nodes, it's very simple for Elasticsearch to kind of distribute this data. Just needs to take the data from one shard and move it over somewhere else. So a shard is basically the, the unit of scale in terms of data in Elasticsearch. One of the problems with this approach is basically that if one node goes down, I can't finish now, right? <laughs> um, if one node goes down, 
uh, you kind of lose the data which has been in this node because it's not being duplicated. So the second notion of shards is basically to provide availability by providing copies of those shards. So by configuring another property called number of replicas, I can basically configure how many copies of each shard should exist in a cluster. In this example, we have one copy for each shard, and if any of those nodes exit the cluster, has a network problem, or you shut it down for maintenance, all of the data is still available. And this is a kind of data scalability. One other nice property of this is because you have all of your data duplicated, you can basically have twice the throughput of queries because you can either query the first chart or the second chart, the copy available. And that's just a nice side effect of having replicas available. You, it allows for read scalability. Okay, let's talk about search. Kind of important for Elasticsearch. So the first thing we should be aware of is how to add data. Again, everything is HTTP and JSON based by default. So what happens here is I kind of have a shorter syntax for this one. Instead of specifying the host, this is the HTTP method, put, this is the UI. So basically I'm creating a new resource in terms of RESTful terms. And this is the HTTP body. The HTTP body consists of four fields here. Uh, name and authors are basically string fields. Authors is a bit special because it's an array, but it's still a string field. Um, pages is simple, it's an integer. And publish add looks like a string field, but Elasticsearch has some kind of detection mechanism to find out, okay, this looks like a date, I'm going to store it as a date. The reason for this is obviously that the sorting is different if you have date or string. Second thing you can do is you can get this document back after you stored it. So that's the read operation of CRUD. Uh, that's the D operation of CRUD. You, there's also an update API if you want to update the document. But where it gets more interesting is basically searching for data. So what happens here is, again, we are using the index books. We're using a type book. So every document basically has a type. And the type is just some sort of description. So in this example, it's a book, but maybe you also would have an article or a teaser or something like that, or a table of contents in the, in the context of a book syntax. And the one is basically just a kind of ID to identify this specific book. So what happens here is um, that there's a search for the books index, for the type book, and we basically search for Elasticsearch. This Q parameter is pretty much known from Google. If you search anything at Google, you also have a Q parameter equals whatever. Um, the problem with this is that you basically, if you have long and complex queries, and this is a very simple one obviously, uh, you don't want to put this as part of the URL line because this means you have to apply URL encoding and suddenly you have like really long URLs to query. The workaround in Elasticsearch to write, write more complex and long queries is basically to put the query in the body and use the query DSL, which is basically just a JSON specification how to write a query to like write more complex queries. In this example, we are basically searching in the name field for Elasticsearch, but there's also a filter, which means there's kind of a where clause in SQL, uh, where we are searching the published ad field uh, for greater than new minus one year. So this search query basically searches for book that contain Elasticsearch in its name and that are newer than the last year. Uh, the first thing here is some metadata, like how long the search took in milliseconds, uh, how many shards have been involved, because you cannot, you could search over an index with five shards, with 20 shards, you could search for all of your indices, and this is just an indicator also if there's any failed shards, so imagine there are some nodes who have left the cluster, then we kind of need to inform you as well that the search is incomplete. And then there's a hits field, and the hits field contains the number of documents that have matched, but more interestingly enough, it contains another nested hits array, that contains the original JSON that has been indexed before. This is nice because you don't have to go to a secondary data store to like, get the data back. You can just send this back to your client and work with it without having to worry about wasting more time as part of a request to get it from somewhere else. Okay, that was a simple search. So far we basically only searched for book, which contains Elasticsearch, and that's in more than one year. But you can do more. I was talking about analytics capabilities at the beginning. So basically counting certain properties of the document that have been hit as part of the query. So what you can do is you can add aggregations to your query. Uh, what this does is, is having a terms aggregation on the category field. 
So imagine every book has a category. Some have IT, some have biography, some are fiction, some are novel, whatever. And if you search for Elasticsearch, we want to know how many books fit into which category. And this is what this term segregation is basically doing. So if you execute this query and you wait until it returns, you will get back the hits, which is basically the same response you saw before. But in addition, the response is enriched with the aggregation data. And this aggregation data contains information how many books, in this example it's a dot count, basically match the key search. So we found one book that's in the search category in this example. And this is the nice part, you can combine both of those. So you can write really complex full text search queries, and on top of that you can aggregate those results. One nice part about aggregations is you can nest them deeply, which means you can, for example, execute a query for log files, let's take Apache log files as an example, or whatever you have, where you want to count how many documents per each day, or for each day were happening. So last day you got one million log messages, the day before you got two million log messages, and so forth. But on top of that, you could split those per day and per log level, for example. So you know that you got half a million error log messages yesterday, but only 100,000 error log messages the day before, which hopefully tells you that you should check your log files or your production application to see why so many error messages have popped up. So that's really nice about aggregations. And the nice part is you can do this on query time. You don't need to re-index your data to actually get this kind of information. Okay, how does search work internally? Um, the problem is we have a distributed system, we have shards, those shards are somewhere placed in our cluster. So when a search hits the cluster, the first thing is to find out which shards need to be queried. And there's a data structure called the cluster state, which contains those information. Every node in the cluster has it. And based on this information, uh, the number of or the shards are basically picked or selected. What then happens is, if we have an index with four shards, um, those four shards are each hit. So if we search for Elasticsearch and we want to get the first 10 results, each of those shards needs to find out its own top 10 search results. But after this, we need a second round trip because now we have 40 results to find out the top 10 of this top 40 to get the real top 10 of all of the shards that are involved in the query. And this is one of the secrets of a distributed search that you basically have to have some sort of priority queue which needs to be sorted after a query or while a query is being executed. And only if we get the real top 10 after this, we can return to the client and kind of deliver this, this documents. But we always need two steps as part of a distributed system here. So what happens on a single shard? And this is one of the things where basically Lucene comes to place. Who knows Lucene? Oh, that's surprisingly a lot. That's good. I like it. So Lucene is basically a full text search library. The problem with Lucene is you need to know a lot of Java, you need to learn a lot of like how full text search basically works to make use of it. And Elasticsearch is basically, if you want to tell it in a hard way, a distributed HDB based Lucene index. And we're doing all the work on top of that to kind of uh, take over the work that Lucene as a library is not doing. So Lucene is basically very good in a single index search and a shard is a single index. And what's an index? an index? An index is basically an inverted index, as we call it in IT. But if you open a book at the end, you, it's called index, where basically there's a list of terms and it's mapped to a number of pages. So this is what an index in a book is, and this is what an inverted index in IT is. Whatever. We are really good with naming. We saw it in the last talk, the talk before the break. Um, and this is basically how an inverted index looks like. If you keep in mind, we had this document with the authors. The authors were Clinton Romney and Zachary Tom. And what happens is some sort of analysis phase inside of Lucene, which kind of splits each term with certain criteria. Most often, this criteria is a white space. And this means that four terms have been put into the inverted index here. So it's Clinton, it's Romney, it's Tom, and Zachary. So you can see that this list is kind of sorted. And the mapping here shows in which document the, this term occurs. So if you index a second document with Clinton Gormley as the author, he would be number one and number two. The nice part of this is if you execute a full text search and you're searching for Gormley, it's really fast because we just have to look it up. We don't have to do any complex stuff at query time because we did the complex and tedious work at index time. Uh, this is basically the whole magic behind an inverted index and why it's so fast with full text search. 
Um, one of the things where inverted index is not really good is basically reconstructing the original value out of it. I have no idea if Clinton Gormley or Clinton Tong or Gormley Zachary have been indexed as the original value when just looking at those things. However, when you execute a query, you always get back the original JSON. And the thing is, it would be really, really costly to create the original JSON on the fly when we're returning search results in Elasticsearch. The workaround to this is, we just take the full JSON body and put it into its own field. So when we have to return the JSON itself, we can just do a single field lookup instead of trying to reconstruct it on every query. And this makes it very cheap and very fast for us to return the original JSON back to the client. Another example. Um, when we saw the first query, we saw query equals Elasticsearch. And if you know SQL or any other query language, you usually have to specify where to search. Well, we just searched for Elasticsearch, and suddenly we got back our Elasticsearch book without specifying a field or anything like that. And the reason for this is that there's a simple mechanism, um, or that there's a special field again in Elasticsearch, which is called the all field, which just concatenates all of the values of a document into a single field. And this single field is simply used for search. And this is the reason why a search for Elasticsearch actually yields results. We just do something more on index time to make it really simple for you on query time. Uh, you could potentially configure this kind of behavior. So you could have your own fields that are concatenated together. For example, if I'm a bookshop, I think most of the searches would not only go to the title or only to the authors, but you always want to search in both fields. And you could just concatenate those two fields when indexing your documents, um, and then just search a single field. So in this example, if I searched in this field for Elasticsearch and Tom, because I know the, the last name of one of the authors, I would still get back my document. Okay, another thing which is really important when executing searches with Lucene or Elasticsearch or any Lucene-based solution is a feature called filters. And the first thing you need to know is that there are two different types of queries. The one thing is a query, and a query is doing some sort of scoring. So there's some math involved basically to tell you that the word you searched for matches that good for the document I just found. Yeah, it's a TF-IDF scoring by default, but you can change it. Um, and this means that this comparison or this calculation returns a number. It basically tells us that Elasticsearch is a definitive guide. It's most likely a very good match when searching for Elasticsearch. Uh, on the other hand, there are things like filters, which either decide if the document is inside or outside of the result set. Um, take, a, take a range filter, for example. If I'm searching for books which are between a certain price range, the book is either in or out, but there's nothing in between. I don't need scoring for this kind of functionality. And this thing is called a filter. And a filter uses an internal data structure called a bit set. So this bit set here contains of bits, obviously. Um, and each of these bits basically represents a single document. So in this example, we are filtering for <coughs> books in the category, uh, for category search, and there are three books which have this category set. This alone doesn't really like, sound useful, but the nice part about filters is they are cached. So if you have one query that executes the search, and then you execute a second one, this data structure is still there. So you don't need to go to disk and basically kind of recreate this data structure, but all you have to do is to check the data structure and you know okay, 50% of my documents don't fall into this category and you can immediately start scoring. So this is really a performance game. Another nice feature of filters is, because it's a bit set, they are very simple to combine. So building the intersection of two different filters is really, really simple. You just need to add or all them in this example, or negate them if you want. So whenever you use search or execute searches, make sure you make use of filters. Okay, another thing. Missing fields. This is something that bite us or bit us a couple of times. So the problem is, how do we search an inverted index when we have a search where we search for all documents that are missing a field? Because the inverted index only contains data if you actually indexed something. If I leave the author's field empty, the inverted index is not changed. So the one or the costly solution, the nice solution would be you merge the posting list of all of your documents which are in this field, and compare them with all of the documents in this index. The problem is, this doesn't scale. 
that might be fast with a thousand documents, with a million documents, but with a billion documents, this gets a really, becomes a really expensive operation. So the solution to this is pretty simple. You just have an own field where you index all of the field names, because suddenly your query is really small. You just need to check the field names field if a document contains a field name or not. And this is kind of the inverse index of the all field, where we took all of the values of a JSON document, and in this example, we just take all of the field names of a JSON document and store it in its own field to make sure it's fast. Okay, let's talk about aggregations. So this was kind of a quick overview of a search. Um, aggregations are different because the problem with aggregations, or the nice part about aggregations is you can just execute them as part of the search. The bad part of aggregations is it's a completely different execution. You can't just do a search. Because the first thing you do is you execute a search, you're getting back documents, and then you use all the documents you got back to actually do this aggregation computation. So the comp execution model is completely different. Um, so when you, when you do a full text search, you can utilize the inverted index because you're searching for terms and you're getting back document IDs. But when you do aggregations, you already have those document IDs and you need to get back the original values. Imagine that you want to aggregate for the author. The thing that we want to have is, you, you know that when you search for Elasticsearch, you get back a book that contains two authors, Clinton Gormley and Zachary Tom, and then you want to aggregate on them. Uh, I think I have an example. No, I don't, sorry. Um, and when you want to aggregate on them, this basically means that you need to take the document ID and get back the original value. And this means you need to kind of invert the data structure, which is called uninverting the index, and makes it really complex again because we are so good with naming an IT. Um, just imagine that you need to basically turn around the data structure of an inverted index to execute aggregations. So this is the inverted index you already saw, and this is the data structure we actually need to aggregate on an author, for example. We need to know that the document ID number one contains Clinton Gormley and Zachary Tom as an author in order to count how many books Clinton or Zach have written, have written so far. So again, it's really hard to get from the inverted index to the field data structure, but with a small trick, again on index time, you can basically just store the original value, Clinton Gormley and Zachary Tom, while indexing a document, and then use this data structure to basically create the field data structure out of it, because this is really simple. You just have to turn it around. And in addition, you can just take basically this data structure and write it on disk as well which now many people leads to the complaint that we are writing a lot of data in Elasticsearch twice. That's not true, we're usually writing data a lot more often. But one of the things with this is, um, if something is fast on query time, it's not a bad thing to write more data on index time. And this is just something to keep in mind. The important part is that you are able to control when this data gets removed. And this is simple in terms of Elasticsearch or scene. If a document gets removed, all of this duplicated data is gone as well, not part of your queries anymore. Um, we, we all know this from normalization in SQL. We try to normalize the hell out of everything until it's slow, and then we revert this process and duplicate a lot of data. Uh, the principle is basically the same. Um, field data used to be an in-memory data structure, but since the release of Elasticsearch 2.0, um, by default it's not anymore. This data structure is written to disk which again means that more disk space is needed, but far less JVM heap. And this is usually more efficient because you usually have more disk than you have JVM heap available. And it also prevents huge garbage collections. A couple of specialties with, with aggregations and certain implementations. So um, there's an aggregation called the cardinality aggregation, which counts distinct elements. And counting distinct elements, the naive solution for this is, you load all of the data into a set, and then you get its size, and then you know how many distinct elements you have. And that's a great idea until you have a distributed system. Because even if you have the size, the elements might be vastly different per shard. So the solution doesn't work at all. You would, have, you, know, you would need to have, again, one central system which collects all of the data. And uh, that's basically the reason uh, why this is a useless approach. The solution to this is basically something called hyper lock lock, which is a probabilistic data structure. This means it's not 100% exact, but it has a far, far lower memory footprint. And the successor to this is called hyperlog.plus, so we can be really looking forward to the next naming scheme. Um, the nice part about this is that the data structure that this algorithm basically spits out can be merged. 
So we can take the hyperlog of plus plus results from 10 different charts and merge them together to get the unique, or to get the cardinality count. Um, another data structure is the um, percentiles aggregation, which calculates percentiles. Again, the naive approach would be to have a sorted list of all values. Doesn't really work in a distributed system. Um, there's an algorithm called T-Digest, which in turn is based on an algorithm called Q-Digest. And uh, that one, again, saves a lot of memory. Um, it's, again, not 100% accurate. And it's more accurate the more extreme it gets. So a 99th percentile would be quite accurate compared to the original value. But a median, which is the 50th percentile, would potentially be not as accurate. It's just something to keep in mind when using those aggregations. Percentiles are usually very useful for stuff like uh, SLA checking, when you want to make sure that most of your requests fall inside a certain SLA response time, for example. OK, just a couple of things to, to uh, cover pretty quickly. One of the good things of Elasticsearch is it can easily max out any of your resources. Um, so no matter if you need a lot of CPU, if you do indexes, or if you execute searches that require certain calculations, for example, a geosearch uh, requires a fair share of CPU, um, I hope. As we write a lot of data, having SSDs is always a good idea. Memory can be taken a lot easily. Network must be fast, because if one node goes down, we need to send a lot of data over the network, or if you, if you do uh, backups. Um, one of the nice parts about memory is, um, or that's a recommendation, have endless memory. It doesn't really work in practice. Um, so the idea is have as much memory as feasible. The reason for this is the file system cache. So, if you use OS X or Linux, you probably know the file system cache. If you cat a file, it might take a moment if it occurs for the first time. If you cat the same file on your terminal a second time, it's there instantly. The reason for this is that the operating system has loaded the whole file in memory because it kind of assumes you might want to use this file again. So you basically have an in-memory access of your file. And this feature is called the file system cache. It's basically the most developed cache in any Unix operating system. So if you can make use of it, you should definitely, because you won't write a better cache than this one. Um, Elasticsearch uses this one heavily, because the data file that Elasticsearch or Lucene creates are mutable. Um, and this means that no matter how much memory you have, it can just be used for the file system cache to make your searches faster. This is also the usual recommendation with Elasticsearch that you should only use half your memory for the JVM hint, because the rest is always used by the file system cache. Uh, there are file handles. There are still operating systems or Linux systems who think that uh, 1,024 file handles are enough for every user. I think it's an idea from the 70s, where Linux was a multi-user file system. Today, it's more likely a single service uh, operating system. Um, memory locking is important. So by setting this configuration parameter in Elasticsearch, uh, what happens is that on startup, the process tells the operating system, never ever swap memory of this process to disk. Because if that happens, you implicitly have a slow service. If you have a Java garbage collection and parts of this memory are written on swap on disk, it will just take ages because the disk is slow. Now, when you want to have a fast service, don't swap. Simple rule. Another thing is a feature called the OOM killer, the out of memory killer. Some Linux distributions have this enabled. And this basically means that if there's a process taking a lot of memory and there's the danger of all memory being eaten up on Linux, which means Linux just freezes, um, then kill the process which takes the most memory, which in most times is Elasticsearch. So this is a feature you should not really enable if you want to have a stable service. A couple of distributed aspects. Um, I don't have any big things here created. One of the things to just keep in mind is that the distributed system acts very differently than uh, I don't know, Java application running on a single CPU, because you know either it's up or down. Distributed systems have states in between. Uh, this is just a couple of things to keep in mind when working with distributed systems. Um, some things don't work as expected. It's especially important when doing benchmarks. If you do your benchmarks in that point in time where there's no other load on other Amazon machines, you might get screwed benchmarks and vice versa. If you do your benchmarks at that time when Netflix had the biggest load on Amazon, you might be affected by another Netflix system on your virtual machine. OK, just a quick wrap up. Um, speed is key and important. That was my take here. And we try to make sure that Elasticsearch stays as fast as possible with things like probabilistic data structures, which might work for you or might not, depending on if you need exact values or not. Um, search is a big trade-off at the end of the day. And I already tried to point this out. It's important to keep in mind. 
Doing things at query time always means the query will be slower. Doing things at index time and writing the data structures you need later on for your queries always will be faster. A uh, known example is that you search for terms which are right next to each other. The slow possibility would be that you search for two terms and you get the meta information of the position of those terms and then you compare all of those positions if they are next to each other. The uh, search solution would be that you write those two terms in the inverted index directly. So you only have to look them up in the inverted index instead of comparing positions. And search is a lot of this trade-off game. You just need to be very aware of that, which means please read the definitive guidebook because this explains it a lot. It's a lot of things to know. Benchmarks are important, but please do it with your data, and please do not trust the internet. The internet is full of benchmarks with different results, and none of those will help you. So if you want to get up with good numbers, use the same hardware, use real-life data, and make sure you're running those benchmarks a lot of time. Also, to not introduce any regressions or stuff like that. Okay, um, I think we have a couple of minutes left, like four, five, three. Yeah. Yeah. Four, awesome, we have tons of time left. Um, so, a couple of features which have been introduced recently in Elasticsearch 2.0, uh, which are worth highlighting. Uh, one is automatic I.O. throttling, which basically means that there are kind of competing resources in Elasticsearch and Lucene, like searching and indexing is basically a competing resource because you need to be as fast searching or seeking the disk when executing indexing, uh, searching, as well as you need to write a lot of data when executing an index operation, or lots of index operations. And what you can do in Elasticsearch in earlier versions was you could kind of throttle certain operations to so many megabytes per second. But this means even if you don't do searches but you just do indexing, it's kind of capped. And the automatic IO throttling kind of finds out what is happening currently and uses this for dynamic throttling instead of you have it specified. Um, pipeline aggregations are one of the major features of Elasticsearch 2.0. So far you could run aggregations. But what you couldn't do is running aggregations on top of aggregations, which basically means if you want to do stuff like uh, moving averages, for example, you would need to take the values from Elasticsearch and do this yourself. And pipeline aggregations allow you to do just that. So you can aggregate on top of the results of aggregations, which is really powerful. Who views a Java developer? It's not a bad thing. Um, who of you has a security manager enabled in the application? That's a bad thing. Um, so the security manager is one of the great features of Java at the end of the day because you can kind of configure it in startup to only, for example, allow for certain files to be opened. And if something else is being opened or certain network connections, the security manager throws an exception and tells you, OK, this doesn't work. Um, this is a great feature because if there's something wrong with your application or you've got a security hole and someone is trying to like, read all of your directory data, the security manager would prevent it. Well, it's a lot of work to get this one up and running and to have it right, but it's very well spent time. Um, if you migrate from older Elasticsearch versions, take a look at the migration plugin, because we have a couple of breaking changes in Elasticsearch 2.0 on the buff. And this plugin basically tries to tell you if there's something wrong, or if there's something which cannot be, or which won't work on Elasticsearch 2.0 without the indexing. So if you have old data, make sure you install this data on your existing, uh, this plugin on your existing cluster. Uh, I would just skip this one. And uh, again, resources, take your time to read instead of just trying new technology and throwing it away after two minutes if it doesn't what, it, what you want to do. But I hope it's pretty no common knowledge. Um, check out the forums. If you have a question, please always use the forums. Uh, we, have, we, we take a lot of time to like, skip through the forums or help on IRC or whatever because it's really important to us to like, help people in the community. It's part of my day-to-day -day work. Uh, use the GitHub issue tracker. Uh, if you're bored next February, uh, go to San Francisco to our conference. <laughs> it's going to be like 2,500 people, so it's going to be really packed. Um, if you want to talk, give a talk there, just submit one. It's going to be an awesome conference. A bit bigger than here, I guess. On, apart from that, I think I'm pretty much done. We have five minutes left for questions, so if you have questions, just ask. This is the URL of this presentation. If you're bored, there's a couple of things you could read about. Basically, all the stuff I mentioned. There are a couple of videos from the last Elasticom conference, uh, which explain a lot of the stuff, like the probabilistic data structures in more detail. Um, so, yeah, do we have questions? Sorry. There's a question. Uh, is it included in your duties? Uh, 
uh, also working with uh, Spring Data support for Elasticsearch? Uh, I think that's something that the people who work on Spring Data are maintaining. Uh, okay, because uh, uh, pretty much Spring uh, Data is limited to uh, 1.7 version of uh, Elasticsearch uh, if you try to connect like yeah. to cluster and stuff. And yes. uh, when I uh, asked the guy uh, who was in charge of that, he said that uh, Elasticsearch uh, 2.0 uh, has some changes, yeah. so API is broken and uh, it's like not in foreseeable uh, future when you get the support. So uh, are you kind of willing to get in touch with them and sort it out? We, we probably should. So the question, just repeating, is what about Spring Data? Um, Spring Data has an Elasticsearch integration, but that one right now is only for 1.7. And yeah, I think we need to get in touch with him and maybe help him to upgrade it to 2.0 or 2.1. So, um, one of the big question, why would you choose uh, Elasticsearch for the solo? Um, big question, I think I'm the wrong one to answer this, to be honest, because I've made my choice. Um, <laughs> And the most important part is there are things which both do very similar because they're based on the routine. There are things which both do differently, like the distributed system arc, um, aspects and stuff like that. And I think it would be totally wrong from my side to give an answer, this is better. And you need to test it out and you need to try it out. There is no kind of silver bullet like, this is my checkbox and this is what Elasticsearch is doing better, which I obviously think it does. But on the other hand, I'm not a solo developer and maybe things have changed a lot. So. I would always try it out and not trust the sentence of one or the other side. It doesn't make sense. For the search for, um, <coughs> let's say, a wiki, uh, Wikipedia, and uh, why is the percentage of uh, actually stored data against this, uh, the document? Well, it's triple size or...? It depends on the configuration. There's no general rule. You can. You can change it that it's 50 times the size, which is perfectly fine if it returns the search results you have, but you can also change it to be 1.2 times the size. The average for your appliances, do you know? It, it used to be, for example, if you use Logstash for Apache data, it used to be 3x, but now it's far, far lower, so now it's 1. Point something. So we constantly work on that to him. So th this is one of the big features of Elasticsearch 2.0, because it's based on Lucene 5, that we added a lot of compression features, or that a lot of compression features have been added in the scene, and they will help you a lot in that case. Okay, it's so basically if, less than two minutes. Most of the time it is, but again, configuration issue. That's like, I can only give consulting answers here without knowing deep insights. You have just duplicated these rivers uh, for loading data. What is the proposed way? All right, let's, let's take that as the last uh, question because I need to explain what rivers are without telling that they have been removed. So rivers was a functionality built into Elasticsearch to basically get data from somewhere and store it in Elasticsearch. So it's kind of a pull mechanism. And we had a Twitter river, a Wikipedia river. Uh, at my first job in touch with Elasticsearch, I wrote a JSON river because I thought it was smart. Um, and we kind of found out that the biggest weakness of those rivers is, on the one hand, Stability, because a river works like that, that it only runs on a single node in a cluster. But if you introduce a memory leak in your river, you shut down node by node, because if the one node with the river goes down, the river gets allocated elsewhere. So that was one of the problems. The other problem is, you have an Elasticsearch cluster with 50 nodes. The river runs on a single node, and you get the data. So this means, this once, so your index performance will never be faster than the single node. And that didn't make sense for us from a distributed system aspect. And this is the reason why we basically removed rivers in 2.0. We deprecated them a long time ago. And the workaround is that you should use something like Logstash or another external component to push data into Elasticsearch instead of pulling it. OK, I think we are out of time. If you have questions, I'll be here all day. And I will definitely be here at the evening of the year. So